at the end of the night. We send out a monthly newsletter that's got, you know, again, updates on classes, just different little stories about what's happening at the museum. I link all of our podcasts and all things like that. So um, as Diana said, my name is Cami Ahrens and I am the curator at the Foxfire Museum. Um, if you were here last uh, month, you learned a lot about Foxfire and this month we're gonna be taking kind of a, a closer look at some of the Foxfire stories. So we're here to celebrate Women's History Month and to do that, I've selected um, five women from the Foxfire archives that kind of illustrate just a, just a sampling of the diverse narratives that are in um, our 2700 oral history <laughs> um, archive, which is pretty vast. So this is by no means you know, a synthesis or um, comprehensive look at the narratives that make up women's experiences in Southern Appalachia, but I hope it'll give you just kind of a nice sampling of what's there. Um, these stories that I'm presenting today are coming straight from our upcoming book, which is going to be um, the Foxfire Book of Appalachian Women that's slated for publication in March 2023. So look for it next year. But um, we're really excited to have that off to the press. And I hope this, again, will just give you a great um, preview of what that'll be. So I've pulled this quote from Carrie Stewart because I think, you know, it's just a really great perspective of the 70s and I think we can all kind of look at what's happened since the 70s and um, reflect on this quote as well. But um, Foxfire, for those of you who were not able to make it to last month's lecture, is a organization that focuses on collecting oral histories and preserving culture and traditions here in Southern Appalachia. But it is a student-led um, organization. So it grew out of a high school program in the 1960s and became a magazine, then became a book series, and then became a museum here in Raven County. And we've been continuing that tradition of working with students and getting them out into their communities. So we still have high school students who come and work with us every single year going out, documenting the culture around them, experiencing the um, culture hands-on by working with different heritage skills, working with different people in the community. Um, and so that's where all of these stories are coming from today. They're coming from those student experiences, those student interviews. And I just can't get enough of this picture with these boys <laughs> surrounding. Um, that's Granny McCurry right there sitting on her swing, and I, it's a wonder they didn't break it. But um, it's also, you know, it was an internationally recognized organization, and we had several exchanges of teachers and students who came here to learn how to do Foxfire and take those skills back with them. So that's where those um, photos come from. But the stories, again, that they collected really span a diverse um, experience in Appalachia. So one of the things that we mentioned last time is the students were really interested in dispelling stereotypes in Appalachia, right? Um, if you were here last time, I pulled up little Abner and a picture of a moonshiner. Um, you can go to Walmart and get the moonshine t-shirt that says, where in the heck is Clayton, Georgia? It makes me cringe every time I see it. Um, but that's just not Appalachia, right? We, we know that's not Appalachia. Um, we know that there are so many different things that make this place special. And these really come through in some of the women's narratives that we'll be sharing today. Um, and I also just wanna, again, encourage you to remember that this is by no means the definition of Appalachian women. There are so many more stories out there that aren't told in the Foxfire archives. There are so many other amazing projects out there that are doing similar things and collecting a lot of the stories that we don't. Um, so if you're interested in that, I can give you resources, but just, just know that, again, this is just a sampling. Um, but they do kind of expose the rich human and cultural diversity of the region. Um, I'm pulling in an example of a Catawban woman today. We also have a lot of narratives from black women who have these oral histories that were passed down through their family that tell of these experiences of slavery in the mountain, stories that otherwise would have been lost if they'd not been captured because they were transmitted orally. And so that's, that's kind of the beauty of oral history and what makes these stories so um, special. These women also show how um, in Appalachia, especially, you know, before we have all kinds of different jobs that we can go out and do when people are still focusing on working in their homes, working on their gardens, in their fields, um, women really didn't fit any of the stereotypes of gender, you know, that come out of the Victorian rhetoric that we see around the turn of the century. 
these women were out doing as much or more work than the men sometimes. And um, after the Great Depression and around the time of the Second World War, when we see the first factories come into Raven County, a lot of times it was women who were leaving the home to go and work in those factories before men even had um, employment of that type. So really interesting in how they kind of, you know, break those barriers as well. Um, there were really important community activities that were a part of these areas that made up um, women's experiences, these shared experiences of quiltings and corn shuckings. I'm sure we, you know, have all maybe heard stories or maybe are lucky enough to experience those ourselves. Um, these were important ways for women to come together and to build a network of support that could help them through more difficult times. But it also was a, a point of enjoyment, right? You could sit around a quilting frame without men and gossip. It's, it was, you know, what maybe beauty shops are now. Um, so these were a really important part of um, the culture at the time and again still are. Um, so I want to play just a short quick clip of this. But before I do, I just want to give you a disclaimer that this is on um, film from like the late 1970s, early 1980s. And if you know anything about film, it tends to degrade. So when it was digitized, it was already had some issues. So it is a little bit, um, I don't know, broken up, we'll say. So we'll just watch a few minutes because it is just kind of a nice glimpse at what a quilting would have been like in the 70s and before that even. just a look at what what they were doing in these community activities together and as you I don't know if you could hear but she said that it took them from about 10 o'clock in the morning till about 10 o'clock at night to quilt and my guess is they were probably doing what's known as the elbow the stitch or um, a fan stitch because you literally would just like do it like your um, the length of your arm and just go across because it's the fastest way to do it especially if you're sitting next to somebody so later on in the video they actually talk about how they would sit next to people with like opposing dominant arms so you know um, right would sit next to somebody with left that way they could cover more space without bumping into each other so those were an important part um, and an, an integral way that they built their um, networks 
But they also, you know, included um, men and children in these activities as well, especially in something like a corn shucking. They'd be cooking the dinner for that. Um, I know a friend of mine has shared a story of her husband when he was a kid coming home to find a quilt um, suspended from his parents having a, a quilting going on. So. Lots of um, good memories from those times. So Foxfire is really, as you saw, literally capturing the voices of Appalachian women. And this has been going on, as I said, for decades. And so we can see, if we look at them um, over a long period of time, and this is one of the things that I try to accomplish in the book, you can see the changes in the narratives, the changes that are happening to the landscape, the changes that are happening in technology, to the culture, to religion. Um, and it's a really interesting way to kind of take it decade by decade or a couple years at a time and be able to look at these. So the early interviews really um, you know, reflect on these drastic changes in transportation because think about how radical that would be to grow up here in the mountains, no cars, no trains, right? Um, and then, you know, during your lifetime, you go from riding a horse and walking to school barefoot to somebody landing on the moon. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty drastic to, when you think about it like that. And then you see in the um, narratives from the 21st century, they, they echo these themes. And a lot of these conversations are still happening. What's happening to our landscape? It's being developed, right? There are people coming in who don't, who didn't grow up here. So there's all these new people coming in. What are they gonna do to our land? So we still hear a lot of these themes coming back in a cyclical nature. So it's interesting to kind of look at the long span of these different narratives and see what similarities they have or don't have. So what ties all these people together though, right? We have all of these Appalachian women and can we say that they're all Appalachian women because they have so many different experiences? And I think that we can because they're all tied to this central idea of landscape, right? What makes us Appalachia is that we're in Appalachia, right? I said that wrong. What makes us Appalachian is that we're in Appalachia. So in every narrative, you start to see these little threads of place come out. Um, and you can hear it and you can read it um, about the way that they talk to the landscape. Um, so it's really interesting to read this and um, hopefully it'll come out a little bit in this presentation. And if you're interested, again, I can always direct you to more resources. Um, so for me, like going through these narratives, um, because they are literally taking their voices as an oral history, it really is like you're sitting down with these women and they become grandmothers for us or aunts or friends. Um, and I think there's pieces of advice that we can personally pick up from them, um, even though you know we've never met them. And so the first woman I wanna highlight is Margaret Norton. Um, she was born in 1910 and she died in 1983. And she was actually the first woman that was interviewed um, on tape by Foxfire. And so she was first interviewed in 1967, and this is kind of the setup of the slides. The first date is gonna be um, the date of their original interview. So I, I picked a few that kind of go across like five decades. Um, so Margaret Norton um, was born and raised in Betty's Creek, which is um, up near Dillard, Georgia. And she lived like just down the street from the house she was born in. And she really um, had this strong, strong tie to the landscape that she talks about. And she, at the time that she was interviewed, she didn't understand why people around her were selling off their land because she came from a family that got their hundreds of acres of land during one of the original land lotteries. Um, so when the Cherokee were um, remo not removed, but they were already pushed out of this area. Um, that land was taken by the government of Georgia and put into a land lottery in the 1820s, and that continued in a cycle of years after that. And so she was one of the original families that were here. Um, but she saw all of her neighbors were starting to sell off chunks because their grandkids didn't want to come back here. They didn't want to live here, so they didn't, they didn't want to keep the land. So the grandparents would either sell it in advance of them dying, or after they passed away, the grandkids would sell it. Um, so Margaret was really concerned about what was going to happen here um, because she didn't, didn't want to see those families lose those land, lose the land pieces, because to her, that was her inheritance. These people didn't have money. They lived very simply. What they could produce is what they had. And um, their, their legacy was 
in the land, right? This is what I'm leaving my, my children's when I'm leaving my grandchildren. I know in a hundred years that it's still gonna be in my family. Um, and so for her, seeing people give up their inheritance, she just like couldn't wrap her head around it. But I did think that this quote was kind of interesting because it does contrast a little bit of what I'm sharing with you right now, right? You would think that she'd wanna go back to the old ways and the good old days. And that's not the case. A lot of the women that, and, and men too, in the Foxfire archives, they talk so much about their past and how all these things were wonderful and like how food from a wood stove was so much better. But <laughs> when it came down to it, like they were pretty happy to have running water and electricity and dishwashers or a washing machine. Um, so it is, it is kind of interesting to remember that there were things that they reflected on with, with eyes of nostalgia like we all do, but they did recognize that they were in a better time in terms of um, their uh, lifestyle, for sure. Margaret's also really interesting because she was jam-packed with like folk knowledge. She was this amazing resource for the students to learn about all of these different folk beliefs that were kind of an integral piece of Appalachian culture that were disappearing really rapidly because again, we're talking about oral transmission. If you don't have somebody that's interested in learning it, it's gonna fade away. And so she shared with them really important knowledge about planting by the signs, which is a folk belief of um, gardening or pretty much, pretty much doing anything, honestly, by the signs of the zodiac and the moon. So they believed that there's a specific sign on a specific day that dictates, you know, when you plant your beans, when you harvest your corn, when you cut your hair, um, when you should dig a hole, because if you dig a hole on the wrong day, you won't have enough dirt to fill it back up. Um, so it's all these like really intricate things about knowing when to do these activities. And if you buy a farmer's almanac, chances are it's still gonna have the signs in it, um, which is kind of cool. So she shared that with them. And even though it's a folk belief and it's tied to what we might consider astrology, she was a very devout Christian and she thought that this was um, straight from the Bible. So um, it was kind of an interesting mashup of different beliefs, at least from, from our perspective. I mean, for her, it was probably just completely natural. Um, she was also a remarkable cook and she, in the first several issues of the magazine, ran a recipe column and she would go out into her community and collect recipes from her friends and her neighbors. And a lot of that information got published in the Foxfire Book of Appalachian Cookery. Um, and the good thing about Margaret collecting those as opposed to a student is Margaret knew a lot of the recipes and knew the ways to cook. So when the students went to collect recipes, you know, they didn't understand how these women could just scoop up something with their hand and throw it in. They needed to know like, Okay, what measurement is that? When do you put it in? When do you put something else in? But Margaret could kind of interpret it and write it out in a better way. And so um, she had a really great, one of her first recipes was for like carrot pudding. It's like a really like soupy carrot cake. <laughs> I don't know. She's got some interesting stuff, but she, um, she's an interesting lady. And I think I have, did it work? Okay. So the next one I want to feature is Carrie Stewart. Okay, let's go. So she was interviewed in 1977, and she was born in 1878. So I hope that we all look this good when we are 99 years old. Um, let me tell you, she was something else, and she is so sharp. If you, well, I'm going to play a recording here in just a minute, but you will hear she is so sharp and so um, well-spoken that you would, I mean, you would just never guess <laughs> that this woman was just a few months shy of 100 years old. So um, she was uh, a woman who lived in Franklin, North Carolina, and she was born and raised there. And she's the one who shares some really just chilling stories of her parents' experience in slavery. Um, so her father was sold um, at the slave market in Franklin as a child, and her mother was what she calls a bound girl. Um, so she was handpicked by a white man to be his companion. Um, so they luckily were freed, but they chose to remain in Franklin as well as um, a number of other members of their black community. And they established um, a mission church that was part of the Episcopalian church up there. And she has all of these great stories from her childhood 
of a man named Reverend Kennedy, and he was brought in as their teacher. And the way she tells it, like, school never stopped. <laughs> he was always, like, at the dinner table. He'd be correcting them. He'd be making them in their spare time run their multiplication tables. And she has this um, just reverence for education. Um, and she really, even though she went to school until she was 18, which is pretty unusual up here, like black or white, um, she really says that after she left school, she just kind of forgot it all. Um, so she really made sure that her kids were sharp. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about Carrie is she talks about how she thinks the woman's place is in the home. And yet, despite having like, I don't know, like 10 children, I think, she was a midwife, which to me is a heck of a lot of work. <laughs> so I, I think that um, she really did work, even though she says that she didn't. But she was able to break some of the racial boundaries because she was a midwife. So she actually delivered both black and white children. Um, and in some of the ways that she tells it, there may not have been as much segregation or discrimination. But it is hard when you have um, individuals of color who are talking to white children. I think they held back a lot, and there were some students who reflected on this, that there were maybe some things that weren't shared with them because, because they were white kids. Um, but she did, she did share quite a bit of um, information, and her stories in Foxfire 8, um, it's definitely worth a read. Again, she was a remarkable woman. I'm going to play this clip really quick um, so you can hear it for yourself. Then I remember all of that way back then. Because, see, I was born 28th of November, 18 and 78. Mm -hmm. And my mother, my mother's been there since 1912. My daddy died in 1910. My mother died in 1912. Just two years difference. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been a long time. <laughs> well, what was her name? McDonald. M C D O N N E W L. Were they from up here? Huh? Were they from Franklin? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was born and reared right here in Franklin. And your father? Well, yes, I reckon he was. I don't know. Uh, I really just don't know. My father was born way back then when they sold children, you know, put them on. He said he remembered being sold. They were buying slaves, you know. Now, like uh, this white man owned a woman. And he, uh, he'd pick up, and he's going to buy a woman, you know, so he could ra have children, just like a man buying a cow, raising calves, you know. He'd pick on a woman that he knew was, as he, they said, fertile, you know. And if he saw a woman that had several children, he'd buy her, because he knew he'd have children. And they said that, my daddy tell us, said that if, uh, and they got a woman that had several children, well, they take care of her just like she's a queen. So as you can see, there are some really powerful stories um, in, in the archives that we have. Okay, there we go. So the next woman is Nola Campbell. Um, as you see, she was interviewed in 1984, and she lived in Rock Hill, South Carolina, um, which is where the Catawba Reservation is. So I personally had never heard of the Catawba before. When I hear about Southeastern tribes, you hear about the five civilized tribes, right? Um, like the Cherokee, the Choctaw Creek. Um, and so the Catawba were 
effectively almost wiped out by a smallpox epidemic in the 1700s. And so they um, kind of really withdrew. So she learned over a long period of time, and this is more of like an apprenticeship style of learning. Um, so it's a very, you know, if you think about how much time she would have had to spend to learn these skills, she's also building up those relationships, right? These same sex relationships with women who could become mentors or friends. And so it's a, it's a type of pottery that's hand built. Um, she's got a little duck effigy pot, but she made other pots as well. And then it's also fired in a wood, um, like a pit, like a wood fired pit, as opposed to a kiln. So if we look at the differences between this and European, it's done by women instead of men. It's hand built instead of wheel thrown and it's um, fired in a pit instead of a brick kiln. And what that does, because the pottery's unglazed, is it creates these really cool colors. So depending on the type of wood and the heat of the wood, it'll change the color of the clay, which is really awesome. So we have a few pieces of hers that were um, given to the Foxfire students when she was interviewed in the 1980s. Um, the other thing that's interesting about um, Catawbans is they are um, typically Mormons. So there was a very small Mormon missionary established on the Catawba reservation in like the 1880s. And for whatever, re well, for a lot of different reasons, um, mostly because of the way that the missionaries treated the Catawbans, um, they, it stuck. So they, they still are um, mostly Mormon in um, Catawba. And she herself uh, practiced it because her father was Catawban. Um, I will say from her story, she does have some, again, a tragic story in her childhood because her father died when she was 10, um, leaving her mom and her siblings to have to fend for themselves. So they had to find work to support them. And even though her mom was my, white because the children were um, indigenous, they had a really hard time finding work. It was usually picking cotton or picking fruit and um, they were treated very poorly. They um, experienced some really harsh discrimination, um, but you know, in everything that she says, it made her tougher, and um, she was very proud of who she was and her culture that she came from. Um, got another little audio clip of her. Today's date's June 21st. We're interviewing Nola Campbell at her home in Rock Hill, South Carolina. This is uh, Cheryl Allen, Allison Ann's. So, um, you grew up around here? Yeah, I grew up in a little Okay, is that where you learn about turning or making pie? That's where I learned to make my pie. Um, I learned that from my sister. Mm -hmm. She married my brother. This woman is Georgie Davis. She married my brother. And, um, I never did think that I'd be able to be interested in making pie. So I know that was probably a little bit hard to hear, but she was talking about sitting down with Georgia and how Georgia was like, you have to do it yourself. Um, and so I, I have the links to, this is a digital exhibit, those audio clips, so you can go home and listen to them. Um, maybe put headphones on, it might be a little bit easier to hear. Okay, the next woman I wanna feature is Angelina del Archiprete Davis, and she was an Italian immigrant. She was a war bride. Um, and again, I guess I like all these women because they're all a little bit of a spitfire, but um, she uh, tells an, an incredible story of experiencing the war firsthand. So she was born in Milan, Italy in 1918. Um, and she, in, in a later interview, so her first interview was actually in 1979 when she was talking about um, religion for Foxfire 7. 
But in the 1990s, she sat down with her daughter and she shared this like just long journey of what it was like because um, she was a young teenager becoming a young woman at the time that the war started and so um, and she lived in a big city and it really drastically changed life for her and she became separated from her family for a bit um, and you know just like thinking back through it I'm just imagining you know what's happening right now and what those families must be experiencing you know and the hardships that those people must be facing um, so she was able to find a job working for um, the Allies once they occupied um, Italy. And it's at this time that she met John. And John was um, part of the U.S. Army. And she developed a relationship with him over time. Um, she was very against him at first. <laughs> but they, you know, they developed this awesome relationship. And what they did is they were able to go out and help um, the Italian people help rebuild after the war. And so um, not only were they building a relationship themselves, but they were building this relationship in their community. And then John proposed and she was like, no, 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 like you haven't been home in a couple of years. You need to go home, think about this. And then if you still feel like it, come back. And I think he stayed home for like two or three months, um, which, you know, most of that was travel if you're going by boat. And he was right back in Italy begging her um, to marry him. So they got married and then she, um, she came to Georgia in the 19, um, late 1940s. And um, she was not expecting what she found. So she, she came, you know, they came to, by boat to New York, then they took a train to Georgia. And she has this moment where she wakes up on the train and all she sees is red clay. And she like, so excited. But then they um, go to Atlanta and then they drive up to Clayton, Georgia. And she, <laughs> she says that, um, you know, John had told her that it was a small town, and she's like, this is not a small town, this is nothing. Because at that time, there was really nothing here. And she can't speak English. I mean, the only English she's heard is by literal English soldiers. So when she comes here and hears the dialect, she um, tells this little anecdote where she's trying to look up ain't you in the dictionary because people kept saying ain't she gonna go do this so um, she, she has this really just amazing story of what I imagine to be an incredibly difficult culture shock and transition to just a completely different lifestyle completely different language you know and she's the only Catholic here there's her and one other war bride who's from France who was a Catholic um, in a predominantly pr Protestant region and so it's, it's a really remarkable story and Unfortunately, we have very few um, immigrant stories in our archives. So this is just one of a few that I know of, but it still gives you a really kind of good outside perspective, um, but especially kind of rooted in a specific time period. Um, and so hopefully this audio quality will be a little bit better. Head here, so you don't have to listen to me. He wrote the hug in it, this and that, and she said something to she, ma, the John's mother, you know, I don't know what she said, maybe she said, Welcome, I don't know, but um, <coughs> she, she was talking to me, and I look at her, <laughs> you know, but we was there just. Jumping up and down, it was just cute and this and that and Mary. Uh, we didn't work that day, it was Friday. She, she waited for us to come. And um, she was all dressed up, you know, it impressed me. And um, we were in the house and you, um, they were in the house, I had to go and I they all were talking and yet I didn't understand the world, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, they were monitoring my hair with a match from and this and that. And um, watch it. They say, hi. And I say, oh. <laughs> so it went up to the next day like that. And then the next day they fixed breakfast. And uh, they fixed, they say, a good breakfast, uh, sausage and egg. And, Scrambling like and everything, and when I saw it, I saw it. <laughs> because in Italy, we just copy a, a, a meal, you know, 
coffee and milk, we are dead and, and biscuits, you know, this way. And when I saw the food, I said, what is that? Yeah, because you really didn't have biscuits, it was more like a <coughs> bread from the bakery. Yeah. Yeah, we, we never prepared bread at home. But when I saw all the greasy ham and stuff, I said, John, can I get up for a minute? Can I go to the bathroom? He said, sure. I went to the bathroom and I was empty. <laughs> oh, gosh, they, they knew I was vomiting, so then he came out and said, if I was sick, I said, yes, I am sick. And I said, I hope it's not like that every morning. I said, I can take it. Because yeah, one time you told me to that eating corn. Yeah, time. I think that that day. We had lunch, you know, big lunch, you know, with jelly pigs, everything, so with chickens, you know, all this stuff. And uh, I like this, they had rice and gravy, and, and I enjoyed that. And, and then she put this big bowl of cream, uh, <coughs> corn, cream corn. And, and I said, what's she doing? I mean, why is strange? You know, why put the corn in it? And I said, John, what's that? And he said, that's corn. And I said, what are we supposed to do with it? They said, eat it. <laughs> I, I, I made a face like that. Then his brothers understood what was going on. And he said, yeah, they don't eat bread and I don't eat corn in, you know, in Italy, you know, they call it just here in America. And he said, what you do with all that corn? I'm sure he said, I say we give it to the animals. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, just a really good look at you know some of the cultural differences and things that we would never think of. I mean, I'm not from here, but I certainly grew up eating corn and just to you know have an animal feed on the table. I can't imagine what that would have been like. <laughs> um, so she she's a really great look um, again from an outside perspective. So the last woman I want to feature is Lena Dorsey. Um, she was interviewed in 2013, um, and Lena grew up in um, Bean Creek, which is a community in Tati, Georgia, so just, just a little bit away from here. And Bean Creek, like the community that um, Carrie Stewart grew up in, was the descendants of enslaved people. So they were um, enslaved by a couple of large uh, landowners in Tati, and <clears throat> in and around Tati, and then after emancipation, they all kind of stayed in Bean Creek. And so they became this really um, insular community that just had so many wonderful things about it. And Lena was um, known as like the mayor of Bean Creek. Um, she was visually impaired and so she loved to just sit by her phone and talk. And so she kind of kept up on all the gossip. So if anybody needed to know anything, they would contact Lena. But she, <laughs> um, she shared stories of growing up and they, they share a lot of similarities to um, some of the other stories that we hear from the time, you know, growing up and the wood stove and the ticking and saving every little thing. Um, but her parents were effectively sharecroppers. And we hear this in some other um, black narratives that are shared with Foxfire students. They talk about their parents being farmers or being tenant farmers, but what they're not saying is that they're, they're sharecroppers. Um, and for those of you who know um, the history of sharecropping in many ways, especially in well into the 50s and 60s, it was an extension of slavery because white landowners were still just renting out land to black people and oftentimes abusing that relationship. Um, so again, these little themes, you have to, you have to, when you're working with oral histories, you have to kind of think outside of what you're reading um, and kind of read between the lines there or maybe interpret things in a different perspective. Um, but she also tells these really great stories about what are the Bean Creek Valley Vets, and that's their baseball team. So this baseball team was a really integral part of the Bean Creek community, and that's one of the reasons that they were so strong as a community. Um, but it also comes through in other aspects of her um, interview. So in this quote that I shared here, you know, she talks about um, people really coming together and supporting each other. And I think that's the strongest theme in her interview. And she has another quote where she talks about how everybody was your parent in their small, in, in um, again, um, inclusive community. It wasn't abnormal for maybe your neighbor to 
you know, discipline you if you were doing something bad. <laughs> like everybody was looking out for everybody else. And it's, you know, these really um, tight bonds of kinship that maybe aren't dictated by blood, but, but really close relationships within a, within a community. And I think in many ways it still persists today. Um, and again, very much rooted in, in place. So I love this quote from Kay Carver Collins, who's a former Foxfire student. Um, and she is a really just amazing woman all around, but she has been a huge, huge part of Foxfire. Um, but she, you know, really kind of summed it up here. You know, she put forth what she believes to be the definition of an Appalachian woman. And I think um, the most beautiful part here is the last line, right? She got it all from her mother. So looking at the ways that our relationships and our communities help build us up and help bring us together um, and also, you know, how that relates to the landscape. And so we are certainly continuing these traditions, right? We aren't just leaving this in the past. Um, they're black and white images because I changed them because I had to edit them for the book proof and I just went with the theme. So the pictures that I shared you, with you earlier, some of those are in color because, right, they're a little bit more recent. So these things continue today. We still, um, as I mentioned last time and earlier, we still have students that come and work with us every summer. I still go out and do interviews, whether it's for the podcast or for, again, this book project, um, and looking at the ways that the culture continues to change so that, you know, 50, 100 years down the road, somebody can come back and do an even longer study. And hopefully, um, these themes will still be running through, these themes that connect us between communities and place. Um, you know, and one thing, another thing that really stood out to me is, you know, the women never really say it outright, but the way that they talk about the mountains, so when they jump from their communities to talking about the landscape, they talk about them in very much a personified way. They talk about them like they have a relationship with them, the same way that they're talking about their mothers or their aunts or even their fathers or friends. Um, you know, it's something that's unchanging. It's a foundation. It's something that they can lean on in times of crisis. Um, it's there for support. Um, and again, it's just kind of fixed and true. And so that's one of the things that, again, going back to this idea of landscape, I think ties all of these very, very different people together, um, which is kind of an amazing thing to witness. Um, and so if you want to learn more, I've got plenty of resources that I can share with you. Um, some of the stories are in a few issues of the Foxfire book. Um, most of them are in our Foxfire magazines. Um, we have the podcast, so Angelina's clip came to you from our podcast. That's free and available to you on our website or wherever you get a podcast at. Um, and then that URL right there, that is the digital exhibit that has six different women featured on it with those little clips from Carrie Stewart and Nola Campbell. Um, and then, of course, you can always come to the museum and meet with our amazing craftswomen who demonstrate for us and carry on these traditions and share them with future students and with, with people who want to take classes. Um, and that's our address right there. And again, all, all of this information can be found on our website. So I'd like to open this up to questions. Um, I'd love to hear from you all what some of your experiences have been um, or if you guys have anything you want to share. In Italy? No. Oh, here? Here. Um, I know she lived in Clayton. Oh, okay. Yeah. She was really foundational in helping get, helping get um, St. Helena off the ground. And she said in her interview for Foxfire 7, which is the book on um, religion in um, Appalachia, she actually said that um, the church really got established after um, the great locomotive chase was made here because so much of Walt Disney's crew is Catholic that they um, were able to bring in a priest and kind of keep him here. So that's kind of interesting. Yes. What about the Bean Creek community? Is there still um, a group over there? As far as I know, um, so uh, our museum director, Barry Stiles, he worked at the Sawtina Coochie Center for a while and he got to know Lena. So that picture was actually from his wedding. He was um, a close friend of Lena's. And I believe when he, you know, I believe in the past couple of years, they were still having Valley Vet games. Um, so that interview was done in 2013. I think at that time they were still kind of doing it. So, yeah. Yeah. I've heard, I didn't know it was in Mm-hmm. 
Okay, well, again, thank you all so much for coming. And um, you know, as I said, we have our newsletter over there. And I every month I send out our podcast and again, anything else that's happening at the museum. And if you um, would like some of these links or more direction where to find more information, um, I'd be happy to get connected with you to make sure you get that. So thank you again for coming. Thank you very much.